Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Tennessee Advanced Energy Business Council Statewide Automotive Innovation Roundtable. My name is Courtney Piper. I am the Executive Director of the Tennessee Advanced Energy Business Council. Our mission is to champion advanced energy as an economic development and job creation strategy. Our definition of advanced energy is technology neutral. That means anything that makes energy cleaner, safer, more efficient, it's in the tent and it includes electricity and transportation. We fully support our governor's goal to make Tennessee the number one state in the country for the electric vehicle supply chain. We're home to four automotive OEMs that are or will be manufacturing electric vehicles and countless suppliers. And what we'll highlight today are the world-class research assets that make Tennessee an automotive and mobility innovation hub, as well as the unique public-private initiatives to increase EV adoption. The format of this event is designed to be engaging and interacting and interactive. So each one of our presenters will have about four minutes for their remarks, which will leave ample time for Q&A at the end. You may ask a question at any time using that Q&A function, that Q&A uh, box at the bottom of your screen, and I will moderate the Q&A after our presenters are done with their remarks. So our first speaker today is Ryan Stanton. He is the Senior Project Manager, EV Evolution at the Tennessee Valley Authority. Ryan. Great, thank you. And uh, just to double check, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Okay, well, thank you. Um, great to be here virtually with everybody. Um, see some familiar faces out in the crowd. Um, so I'll just kind of give a, a quick overview of, of TVA, um, kind of I think the, the, the role that we play in, in this uh, you know, EV, uh, EV and automotive ecosystem. And kind of you know some some things coming down the road. I think I think that are, are pretty exciting for, for Tennessee and the Valley. I've got a few notes here, so let me just uh, work from those. So uh, first of all, just to uh, you know kind of share T TVA is again we are the uh, generation of power transmission uh, organization for the region. We serve about 10 million people across parts of seven different states, including uh, just about all of Tennessee. Uh, our mission, we have kind of a, a threefold mission. We call the, the three E's affectionately. That's uh, energy, environment, and economic development. Uh, so the automotive ecosystem you know, squarely falls in, uh, in all three of those. So the environmental aspect, um, uh, providing energy to the automotive manufacturers and the EV and the automotive suppliers, as well as economic development in terms of recruiting uh, many of those those automotive suppliers and, and manufacturers. So it's, it's very much uh, TVA has been very much in in the uh, in the space of of, of this um, advanced automotive ecosystem, and will continue to be going forward in, in many different ways. You know, from the economic development standpoint, uh, you know, TVA has been a partner with uh, with the state and other other agencies in helping to recruit. Uh, the electric vehicle manufacturing uh, components of, of the, uh, the four EV uh, manufacturers that Courtney mentioned, uh, GM, Volkswagen, Nissan, and of course Ford out in West Tennessee. Um, and, you know, I, I know we'll probably touch on this, but, you know, we're, we're seeing we're in the middle middle of an automotive renaissance right now. This, this transition from the internal combustion vehicle to the electric vehicle is something that is literally unfolding uh, right before our eyes and right inside our you know, inside of our state and it's it's you know it's almost tough to to um, describe or, or even comprehend some of the changes that we'll see as a as a result of that this this fuel and this um, powertrain switch is going to be very significant uh, in a lot of different ways uh, but we can we can touch on that uh, in, in a little bit more uh, detail um, kind of where I sit I, I'm in our uh, innovation and research group within TVA so we are charged with looking out ahead over the future into the future uh, and to see what's coming down the pike and specifically the initiative that I focus on is the electric vehicle evolution uh, so really looking at what's coming next and kind of uh, figuring out what what we need to be prepared for from TVA's perspective and perhaps what role we can play in in that transition as well so we, we are looking at various uh, things in the advanced um, you know, automotive ecosystem, everything from vehicle to grid technologies uh, to wireless charging, uh, managed charging, as well as just you know, overall uh, fleet adoption. So looking at um, uh, larger format vehicles like uh, semi trucks and school buses and all the different types of vehicles that we believe may be electrified over the next um, 10 to 20 years. It's a pretty exciting a time and also there's there's a lot to do so uh, um, I guess the the you know key message and kind of key um, you know uh, 
approach that we take with all of this is that uh, is, is we have to partner in all of this. Uh, the electrification and, and uh, of transportation is going to be a team sport. It's not anything that anybody, any one organization can do alone. So we, we really have taken a, a, an approach of partnerships uh, with, with various entities. So um, we've, we've looked at, uh, we've uh, it partnered with TDEC and Alexa can may speak to this here in a, in a moment, uh, but to develop a fast charging network across the state and across the region. Uh, so we worked uh, very closely together to pull that together and that's now uh, underway. The, the development and deployment of the charging network is, is just starting. Um, we've also developed the Drive Electric Tennessee electric vehicle roadmap, uh, which has kind of put, put in place and established four common barrier areas that we all see as a, as a collective stakeholder group um, that we need to help remove in order to make it easy for consumers to adopt electric vehicles. And I think kind of in, in the same same vein, I hope we can kind of suss out this, this notion of partnerships with respect to kind of the next generation of our, our automotive ecosystem and how we all, how we can all work together um, to, to help develop and kind of create Tennessee as, as a new innovation hub uh, for the automotive uh, for the automotive landscape. Uh, so I'm going to stop there because we, I know we've got a lot of a lot of presenters and I, and I want to make sure we uh, give plenty of time to, to the next the next presenters and of course leave plenty of time for for Q and A. So I, I hope I've, I've maybe started a um, a few thoughts and a few questions uh, which I hope to hope to answer here later on in, in the presentation. Great, thanks, Ryan. Our next speaker is Alexa Wojtek. Alexa is the Energy Programs Administrator for the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation. Alexa, thanks, Courtney. Um, thanks, Ryan, for setting the stage. Um, so yeah, I'm Alexa Wojtek with the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation's Office of Energy Programs, which functions as the State Energy Office for Tennessee. Um, and as the State Energy Office, we work collaboratively um, with multiple partners in this space to support more efficient modes of transportation that can reduce emissions, improve air quality, and decrease our transportation-related energy costs. And also in this space, um, we're seeking to drive economic and job growth uh, in terms of leveraging our strong automotive sector, supply chain capabilities, and highly trained workforce um, in order to take advantage of those economic development opportunities tied to EV and related parts manufacturing. We, want, we have a goal to be, as Courtney mentioned, the number one state to build, own, and drive an electric vehicle, and we're well on our way to becoming that. Um, just to give a little context and kind of perspective from the state government side of things and what we're doing to try and um, minimize some of the market barriers to EV deployment. As Ryan alluded to, we partnered with the Tennessee Valley Authority to build out what we're calling the Fast Charge TN Network. Um, we're leveraging on our side the Volkswagen Settlement Environmental Mitigation Trust Funds, um, and then TVA is bringing additional funding to the table to support the build out of fast chargers every 50 miles on some of our primary and secondary roadways throughout the state uh, to really kind of build that minimum viable backbone of a fast charging network such that you can get from one end of the state to another. We're also more recently we've been collaborating collaborating with the Tennessee Department of Transportation on the uh, deployment of the state's allocation under the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program. So this is the, the what some folk, folks are now calling NEBI. Um, this is the initiative that will be funded by the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act or bipartisan infrastructure law. Tennessee will be receiving about 88 million over five years. And so in the last few months, we've been doing kind of a, a roadshow of public information sessions and listening sessions. We did nine uh, meetings across the state to gather information on how the state should be kind of prioritizing the deployment of these dollars, which will similarly go towards development of fast charging infrastructure on designated alternative fuel corridors, at least in the initial years. Um, and so we've been working with TDOT to develop the state of Tennessee's plan under this program, which is due to the U.S. Department of Transportation by August 1st. And then once that plan is submitted and approved, uh, it will unlock those funds such that we can build out the first solicitation uh, for projects under that. Um, we've also partnered with uh, automotive company Rivian, um, who will be installing level two chargers at all of our 56 state parks. Um, and so this will be a great complement to the fast charging network, as you'll be able to top off um, your vehicle uh, while you're hiking or swimming or fishing in, in one of our beautiful state parks and natural areas. Um, we also have a, a few other level two charging infrastructure programs that we've contemplated that will be 
likely rolled out in the next year or so, um, focused on multifamily housing charging, as well as rural destination charging. And then I'll also touch on kind of some of the fleet technical assistance work that we do at the state energy office. We manage one of the state's two US Department of Energy designated clean cities coalitions. There's the Middle West Tennessee Clean Fuels Coalition and the East Tennessee Clean Fuels Coalition. Um, and so through that work, um, we kind of serve as a boots on the ground, technical assistance provider to fleets, whether they be public or private, or even just to consumers who are evaluating alternative fuels and advanced vehicle technologies. And so a lot of this work um, focuses on transportation electrification um, and kind of our priorities in that space. Um, and so I think I'll pause there. Um, you know, we want to be the EV epicenter of the United States and the number one state in the country for the electric vehicle supply chain. Um, and I think it's through a lot of our active partnerships and engagement with some of the folks on the call today um, where we're able to really leverage all of our strengths in order to accomplish that goal. So thank you. Great, thanks, Alexa. Our next speaker is Doug Adams. He is the Daniel F. Flowers Professor, Associate Provost for the Office of Research at Vanderbilt University. Doug? Thank you so much. Uh, really a pleasure being here. Thanks for allowing Vanderbilt to participate. Uh, I'd like to give you a small snapshot of how we are driving automotive innovation at Vanderbilt. Uh, and just wanna start kind of at a high level. We're really focused on use inspired innovation. So what that means is we're constantly looking for the biggest needs and aiming to solve the biggest challenges. And that means we're collaborating all across our campus uh, in every discipline and we're, we're collaborating across the state to come up with solutions. So for example, how do we fix traffic congestion in our cities? Is there a bigger challenge than that? Uh, congestion isn't just frustrating, but it also, as you know, reduces fuel economy, increases emissions, uh, and we'd like, to, we'd like to solve it. So what if we could help vehicles drive more efficiently? Uh, and we're working actually with TDOT uh, and their vision for what they call a smart corridor along Interstate I-24 to demonstrate that that's actually possible at a city scale. So by using TDOT sensors that line the, the, the highway to track the flow of traffic, Vanderbilt is developing AI algorithms that do two things. First, the algorithms can help TDOT make decisions with traffic signals to smooth out traffic. Uh, second, uh, our researchers are developing better autonomous driving technology that's safer, more energy efficient, you know, to reduce stop and go traffic. Uh, and they've discovered something really remarkable, and that's that a very small percentage of automated vehicles on a roadway can actually increase everyone's energy efficiency around them of every car that's driving on that roadway by as much as 40%, and it also decreases their emissions. So this can have enormous benefits for both internal combustion engine vehicles and EVs as well. And it's not just about improving traffic and how individual automobiles perform. How do we as a state, like we're talking about today, take advantage of what technologies like vehicle electrification can do for us at a regional scale? For example, what are we doing with public transit? Chattanooga Area Regional Transportation Authority is really leading efforts on this front. Uh, we're partnered at Vanderbilt with CARTA to develop approaches to optimize electric bus routing and charging and maintenance for the buses. And the big idea there is to use data, use data for decision-making in the operation of those buses to help ensure that riders receive the best possible bus service no matter where they are uh, across the city. And as we look to improve transportation at the regional scale, we need to solve some really big challenges, just like the challenges Alexa was just talking about, uh, like determining how best to charge a growing fleet of these electric vehicles. And a key question here is how do we ensure, for instance, that rural communities benefit as much as our urban communities from EV technologies? And again, here we're partnered. Vanderbilt's partnered with the University of Tennessee Knoxville and groups across the state like TBA to identify ways in which to deploy EV charging systems so that rural as well as urban communities benefit from what that technology offers. And at the same time, we're also partnered with the independent service operators, the people that give us power across the power grid to ensure that power is available where and when it's needed to support the growing number of EVs. And what about our workforce? Vanderbilt's partnered there as well in, in these areas that I mentioned to drive innovations in the workforce for, for areas like automotive manufacturing and electrification. As an example of that, we are partnered in the National Composites Institute led by University of Tennessee to make cars and trucks lighter, stronger, more energy efficient using what are called advanced composite materials and to train manufacturing workforce in the use of these materials. 
So I think just like the other uh, panelists talked about, partnerships are absolutely critical to the future of automotive in innovation here uh, in the state of Tennessee and everywhere. So I just want to step back in time and share that my first co-op assignment in college back in the day was focused on testing the powertrain of the very first commercial electric vehicle. It was called the GM Impact sedan. And at that time, I can tell you, we never could have fathomed what is happening today with EVs, uh, changes to the power grid and all these autonomous vehicle technology. So it's only by collaborating with academic industry partners across Tennessee that we will be able to meet the challenges today but also upskill the current and next generation uh, manufacturing workers, scientists, engineers who are gonna be able to tackle the challenges uh, that, that automotive innovation uh, brings to us in the future. So really appreciate being here. Thanks very much. Thanks for listening and looking forward to the discussion. Great, thanks, Doug. Our next speaker is Deborah Crawford. She is the Vice Chancellor for Research, Innovation and Eco Economic Development at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Deborah. Thanks so much, Courtney. Um, can you see the slide that I just shared? Yes. Yes, perfect. Let me just. So thanks so much for having me here this afternoon. Um, it's a real pleasure to be with you all and to be um, sharing the panel stage with some of my some of my colleagues here. I'm Deb Crawford. I'm the Vice Chancellor for Research at, at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. Um, we're an institution, just over 31,000 students. Um, about $320 million in R&D expenditures every year and a statewide footprint where the, where the state's land grant institution. And of course, we're very much engaged in the mobility ecosystem here in Tennessee. And I have here just a graphic to give you a sense of the breadth of R&D interests that our faculty have, as well as our interest in the public policy dimensions of the future of mobility and in workforce development. Um, I think uh, Doug touched on a number of the projects that we're engaged in collaboratively um, with Vanderbilt. We also have strong collaborations with our colleagues at the University of Tennessee in Chattanooga, with the University of Memphis, Tennessee Tech, East Tennessee State, um, really sort of leveraging all of the research and academic um, assets in the state. You see here sort of our interests in lightweight materials um, for the EV market, looking at new um, battery technologies for electrification, clean fuels. Our, our Institute for Agriculture does a lot of work in biofuels, connected and automated vehicles, which is something that Doug just touched on as you think about reducing congestion and making vehicles more efficient thinking about that smart infrastructure as well, very related to what Doug shared, and also to what Alexa was talking about, the fast charging stations and being able to deploy EVs at scale and in the very near future. We're also interested in the safety and security dimensions of mobility um, as we think about um, not just the electrification of transportation, but the digitization of transportation. How do we make sure that our transportation networks are cyber secure? We're looking at the public policy dimensions. We have a wonderful Baker Center for Public Policy that works in this space. And of course, workforce development is near and dear to our hearts. Um, if you take a look at the assets that we have here in Knoxville and actually in our campus in Tullahoma, where we do a good bit of aerospace um, mobility work. Um, we have about 150 faculty researchers working in this space and about 60 staff available through the Center for Transportation Research. I thought I'd take this opportunity this afternoon to share with you a new uh, mobility innovation consortium that we're working on developing actually with all of the, with all of the partners here at the, on the panel this afternoon and many more. This is, this is an, what is called an innovation engine. We're seeking NSF funding for this. It is envisioned as a statewide consortium that includes academic, industry and government partners, um, all committed to strengthening Tennessee's mobility innovation ecosystem. Um, you see here, we're, we're thinking about how we leverage all the assets that we have in the state We'll build on the 10 Smart platform. We're super excited to be thinking about this consortium as a, as a gateway 
to the innovation assets that exist here in the state. So hope that some of you out there um, listening to this webinar are interested in learning more about this consortium and might be interested in becoming a partner. So with that, Courtney, I'll pass the baton back to you. Great, thank you, Deb, that's exciting stuff. Our next speaker is Sabia Mishra, the Faudry Associate Professor and Director of C-Tier at the University of Memphis. Hello everyone, Courtney, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can, crystal clear. All right, yeah. <clears throat> um, thanks for uh, having us here. Um, at the University of Memphis, I can speak that um, the University of Memphis being an academic institution, we're involved with a uh, lot of things. Those are related to electric mobility. To begin with, um, I will say that um, as a part of um, US Economic Development Authority grant, we are awarded something called as uh, a project called as, called as Digital Delta. So <clears throat> it's a, um, it's a project that involves um, seven different categories, but I will mention only two of them, which are relevant to today's discussion, that we are dealing with uh, future ready infrastructure. And the second is electric and sustainable mobility. So <clears throat> as a part of future ready infrastructure, what we are doing is that we're identifying that what will be the infrastructure needs when we will have our vehicles be being automated, and as well as they become electric in the future, they are already electric part of them, but not each and every vehicle is electric today. So what we're doing is that we're collecting a lot of data in terms of where people live, where do they work, which type of vehicle they own, which route do they take, so that we can identify what would be a good charging infrastructure um, uh, in, in the region. So this work is uh, supported by Tennessee Department of Transportation, a lot of uh, agencies which are locally supported, um, agencies such, such as Memphis Lights, uh, Light, Gas and Water, um, FedEx is, is in town, we work with them closely. Um, how many number of charging stations those are needed? Uh, we began working with the West Tennessee um, as, as a region. Uh, first to begin with, we work with our transit agency, Memphis Area Transit Authority. Um, we um, essentially have a good uh, knowledge in terms of how many buses do they run, how many of them are electric and what would be their charging needs. Uh, so we look at um, essentially transit uh, needs, need wise, what, what, what are the uh, electrification needed, uh, needed in terms of bus infrastructure. Uh, not only with uh, just technology, we are also interested in terms of workforce generation. Um, so we have a number of courses that we have developed that really deals with uh, uh, electric mobility. Um, so uh, we are working very closely also with uh, the new Ford plant that is coming uh, in the region. So we have um, essentially um, monthly meetings with uh, all the stakeholders uh, in, the, in the West Tennessee region, how to take this initiative forward. Um, so um, in, a, in, a, in a nutshell, uh, University of Memphis is actively participating in terms of uh, how to take the innovation uh, forward uh, in, ter in terms of transportation mobility. We do have uh, a very strong coordination with the uh, Tennessee Department of Transportation, not only just working on uh, electric mobility, but also working on reducing congestion, enhancing safety. Uh, how do we uh, interact with uh, various types of autonomous vehicles when they will be uh, introduced into, into the system? Who will own it? Uh, uh, at the zip code level, even we looked at how various types of vehicle ownership will change in the future and how the state will be better prepared. Um, so, um, this is again a very quick summary, a very uh, top level overview of the work that, that we're doing uh, to, to bring as well as to keep involved in uh, being involved in terms of um, the growth of state of Tennessee in transforming uh, the state's ability towards uh, automotive uh, transportation. So I'll stop here in the interest of time and uh, we'll, we'll add more as, as we go forward. Great, Sabia, thank you. Our next speaker is Reinhold Mann. Reinhold is the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research at the University of Tennessee Chattanooga. 
Thank you very much, Courtney, for the opportunity to talk briefly about recent developments at UTC and in Chattanooga under the heading of transportation, mobility, and electrification. Can I have the first slide, uh, Mallory? <clears throat> So much of what I'll mention uh, was accomplished as a result of providing a focal point for this kind of interdisciplinary research in the form of the UTC Center for Urban Informatics and Progress. We envision Chattanooga as a place where technologies are advanced and integrated to enable successful next-gen transportation and mobility in a nutshell. This includes successful deployment of connected vehicles, electric vehicles, and eventually highly automated vehicles. These vehicles are capable of communications with each other and with the traffic management infrastructure. Next slide. <clears throat> uh, we, we started about three years ago with instrumenting 11 signalized intersections along Martin Luther King Boulevard. And we are now expanding this facility with extra mural funding along two and a half miles of US Highway 27 and into 27 additional intersections as shown in this slide. By instrumenting intersections, we mean deploying sensor technology. <clears throat> that can include cameras, LIDAR, which gives you three-dimensional information, air quality in the form of particulate matter uh, uh, measurements, and sound. We deploy edge computing, uh, communications technology, and we're collecting 24 seven data that can be used to address a number of challenges. These challenges uh, improve, uh, can include, um, are, improve, are including uh, improving pedestrian safety uh, in the spirit of vision zero accidents, which by the way, in 2019 has been accomplished in Oslo and Helsinki, and there's no reason we can do that here. We want to optimize traffic flow, and we are doing this with funded projects, uh, traffic flow with objectives involving low emissions, uh, short travel times, air quality, and enabling the deployment of connected vehicles and developing optimal ways to support EV charging and the de deployment of effective mobility options. We're working with our uh, transit company, Carter, which was already mentioned by, by, the, by Doug Adams from Vanderbilt. Um, one of the cross-cutting interesting technologies that is part of our efforts is digital twins, basically a model of the urban environment that makes it possible to simulate effects before actually implementing changes. And as a good collaboration with ORNL, next speakers from ORNL, he may be expanding on that a little bit. Um, this concluding here uh, in the interest of time, I want to say that this UTC effort has been highly collaborative with the community from the beginning. It has also included many institutions, some of which are represented here today, many researchers and commercial partners across the state and elsewhere. We welcome opportunities to build and expand on this to scale our combined efforts, test equipment, develop new equipment, drive innovation, serve the community, and also advanced talent and workforce development. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Arnold, thank you very much. All right, our final speaker is Rich Davies. He is the Sustainable Transportation Program Director and EERE Coordinator at Oak Ridge National Lab. Rich? All right, thank you. Can you hear me okay, Courtney? Okay, fantastic. So. Oak Ridge National Laboratory, for those of you who don't know us, we're a U.S. Department of Energy National Laboratory. We're about 4,000 acres, 5 million square feet, about 6,000 people outside of the Knoxville area. Uh, we do about $2.4 billion a year of R&D, probably about $150 million of that is transportation related at this point. Some of the work that we do, and I'll put it in five major categories at this point, one of them is one of the hottest topics that we have right now is in the whole topic of electrification. As you might imagine, the, uh, the number of people that are excited about electrification spans nearly every element of the transportation community. The things that we're working on at our laboratory is on advanced battery materials, advanced battery manufacturing, including solid state batteries. We have a tremendous amount of effort on power electronics. Power electronics and electric machinery on vehicles is still quite bulky, quite expensive. We have an initiative to reduce that by about a factor of eight in the volume of those and driving down the cost substantially in that process so that we can pack these power electronics into ever-increasing efficient vehicles. 
Uh, we lead that multi-laboratory consortium and have many cooperative research and development agreements with companies throughout the U.S. on that topic. Uh, another area that we are leading the country is really in wireless power transfer. This is the idea that we're pushing hundreds of kilowatts across the air gaps to charge vehicles both statically and dynamically. Uh, right now with Volkswagen, we have a partnership with one of their Porsche Taycans. We're pushing 270 kilowatts later this year across an air gap to charge that vehicle stationary at, at some of the highest extreme fast charging uh, levels that you can do with light duty vehicles. The other area that's a, an offshoot of electrification is around hydrogen and the hydrogen economy. When you move into the heavy duty vehicles, there's a significant amount of effort into long haul trucking, really having a difficult time holding enough batteries. So the idea uh, research portfolio on the production, distribution, storage, and the end use of that hydrogen as part of a hydrogen economy of the future. And that really is mainly uh, hooked to both the, both long haul trucking as well as hard, hard to decarbonize sectors, uh, such as marine aviation and, and uh, uh, areas that, that sort of on, on road and off road mining equipment, all of these different areas. That's a big part of our portfolio and increasingly focused on the recycling of batteries, ways that we can essentially recover batteries when we start to retire these vehicles and do a complete recycle of the battery materials to limit the amount of virgin material that we need. In the hard to decarbonize, we're working a lot on net zero fuels, things that we can use, anything from hydrogen to ammonia to uh, methanol that is made from CO2 and other aspects so that we can move into things that are very difficult to decarbonize, such as commercial aircraft, um, ocean going vessels, and those are some of the more challenging ones to do. So we're really focused heavily on the ocean going inland waterway as well as uh, aircraft at this point. And locomotives and, and, and rail, they haven't seen much attention in the past, but we actually have programs right now where we're blending hydrogen with uh, diesel fuel, looking at ways that we can offset the carbon footprint of rail. Connected and automated systems, this is also a very exciting area that's getting a lot of attention. And to, to uh, we have multi-million dollar laboratories where we have vehicles on steerable dynamometers and we are essentially take rendering 3D, a 3D world rendered down to deliver data into a perception stack of an automated vehicle. We surround that vehicle with communications that emulate what's happening in that world and we are essentially can convince the car that it's driving in the wild. We do that both for automation and connectivity research, looking for ways to be both safer through our partners at DOT, as well as more efficient through our partners at DOE. It's a big part of what we're working on. An extension of that, and Reinhold mentioned it, we, we have partnered with uh, UT, uh, UTC, uh, multiple campuses at UT actually, as well as uh, you know the city of Chattanooga and TDOT. We've synthesized hundreds of sensors to build a real-time situational awareness across the city of Chattanooga. We are doing two things with that. One of them, we are dynamically retiming the stoplights in order to increase the efficiency of the city. We've measured up to 18% improvements. And we are also taking uh, a partner with Toyota to introduce a connected vehicle. And we're actually delivering it information in real time. So it's changing its drive cycle to become more efficient as it's driving around the city. It's a great partnership inside the city. We, we're really proud of what we've been able to accomplish down there. Transformational materials, many people mentioned it every aspect of composites, lightweight materials. And why this is so important is EVs are much more sensitive to weight. And so the, the cost to essentially, uh, what you can afford to spend to cut the weight of the vehicle is going up. This will enable a whole new field of materials and that those new materials ultimately need joining. And so that's one of the big parts that we're working on as well. And ultimately, in order to embrace the future, you need to have a lot of analytics to look at scenarios in the future. We do a lot of work on freight analysis framework uh, for the Federal Highway and Bureau of Transportation Statistics and a, and a myriad of, of work for the uh, Army Corps of Engineer and other areas on waterways, as well as on the road. So all of that analysis and decision science is, is key to our program. We do work for the manufacturing demonstration facility over here that's relative to relevant to automotive. We have a tremendous amount of work in our grid research facility around Office of Electricity funded research out of DOE. Uh, Doug mentioned this, we are collaboration centric. We collaborate with nearly everybody that's, that's on this panel, maybe everyone. We have about 150 collaborators, sponsors, people that we engage with out of this entity. And Deb did mention that many, if not all of the, of the people that are on this call or on the panel, their organizations are affiliated with the 10 Smart Consortium that we find that founded about five years ago, co-founded it with TDOT because we knew the future commercialization was going to move beyond vehicles. And we hope that consortium remains relevant and gives Tennessee an advantage moving forward. And with that, Courtney, I'll turn it back to you. 
Great. Thank you all. Well, we've got a number of questions, but as the moderator, I reserve the right to ask the first question. So if all of our panelists could just turn their um, videos on, turn their video cameras on as we go through Q&A. Um, so my question to the panelists is, you know, we have seen various media reports refer to Tennessee as the next Detroit. Detroit has a legacy for automotive. That's where the automotive industry started, manufacturing vehicles. But how do we take advantage of this moment in time so Tennessee can carry the label of the future, the future of the automotive industry? Because as we've learned today, it's bigger and greater than simply electrification. So how does Tennessee start to carry this label of the future? Anybody can start. So Courtney, I, as a national entity, I, I spend a lot of time working in Detroit. Detroit, to some extent, from an R&D standpoint, is the home room of the United States for R&D. There's, there's a lot of out in, out in California as well, given moving to connectivity and automation. The key is a lot of the OEMs that I work with inside of Tennessee still have their R&D centers up in Detroit area. And one of the things that we need to do is to, as, an, as a state, find ways to incentivize through both talent as well as uh, facilities and collaborations, find a way to bring more of that R&D down into our region. But to me, that should be one of our top priorities because a lot of the thinking and the future of, of the vehicles still lives in Detroit. And I think we need to help diversify that down into our region. Absolutely. I see a lot of head nodding. Does anybody have anything to add to that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I guess, second uh, Rich's, Rich's comments, you know, D Detroit and, and California are, you know, do seem to be uh, kind of the, the, the center of, of uh, you know, R&D, you know, with, with respect to, uh, to the automotive space. Yeah, at the end of the day, the, the automotive OEMs will always follow where the talent is. Um, so, so it is critical that, you know, if, if we desire to be this, you know, this new um, next generation headquarters for, for the automotive ecosystem, building the, the talent, the pipeline of talent uh, in all aspects, or, or, or at least the, the areas of focus that we want to, we want to look at is going to be critical. Uh, at the end of the day, if, if the, the majority of, of, you know, educated and experienced folks are here, the manufacturers, the big companies, they'll follow. Anybody else? I'll give um, an analogy of what has happened in other sectors uh, in the recent years. So um, when um, in California, when Silicon Valley was, you know, not was, when it kind of reached its saturation point or very close to very high density, states like Texas, you know, they tried to take advantage of uh, generating various types of state level policies in which a lot of companies were given various levels of incentives, such as tax level incentives, some you know, land and other type of incentives. So there has been a great shift in terms of many companies, especially information technology and related to computer science. They many moved to you know, many parts of Texas, especially in the greater Dallas area. Um, and there has been a huge shift of those companies relocating from California to Texas, uh, maybe similar type of you know, policy measures and various types of incentives, those could be given um, so that companies uh, who are located elsewhere, such as Detroit can move to Tennessee. And one such example is the global city where you know, Tennessee, there were more than 30 applicants for that plant but Tennessee was able to win it because of such type of incentives being given to them. So similar type of um, you know, uh, state level policies can be generated in such, in such a way that those companies would be willing essentially to come to Tennessee, which is already in progress. And, and, and the Blue Oval City is an example of that. Okay, great. We will go to Q&A. Ryan, I'm going to start with this one because I, this question constantly comes up and we're just going to, we're going to address this, this myth here right now. Um, will the power grid be able to support all of this? Yeah, um, great, great question. Um, 
Yes, uh, the, the short the short answer. Um, the long answer is uh, this will unfold over time, and there will be you know um, uh, we're going to increase um, the power availability to to meet the need. Um, to go back, you know, TVA was formed in 1933 as a part of the New Deal, uh, part of the, the TVA Act. Um, so we, we've been growing we've been growing the, the the distribution and generation system in Tennessee uh, for nearly a hundred years um, since between uh, post post World War II and, and 1970, uh, TVA actually increased the amount of electricity we, we produced and distributed by six times, six uh, X. So uh, we've 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 been through this this type of um, rapid growth before. We don't see that same level of of increase uh, with associated with electric vehicles. Um, that said, there are, there are multiple um, multiple reasons for load growth that will happen over the over the next ten to twenty years. Electric vehicles are a part, uh, definitely a big part of that that story, um, but we don't see it as as kind of the only driver. So we, we are looking ahead, um, yeah, continuing to support the load growth that will come through economic development, through uh, through additional job relocations, additional factories, um, you know, crypto mining, all the all the various. Um, um, load growth, uh, sources of load growth that are coming. TVA is working very hard to meet that. And I'll note that uh, just yesterday, uh, TVA put out a, a, a pretty significant uh, RFP uh, for 5,000 megawatts of carbon-free power uh, that we are seeking uh, by the end of this decade alone. Um, so that will help ensure that we have we have the, the load um, that's ready to go, that's, that's, that's low carbon, that's reliable, and that's cost effective uh, to meet that load growth. And I'll just to, to, to put a point on 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 that question too, um, you know, as part of the Drive Electric Tennessee uh, EV roadmap, we we work together and said, hey, we want to see, we want to plant a, a flag on the ground. We want to see 200,000 electric vehicles on the road in Tennessee by 2028. Uh, those 200,000 electric vehicles uh, to TVA system represent a, about a half a percent of TVA's load today. Um, so it's a lot of vehicles, but in the grand scheme of things, given the size of TVA's system, uh, it's still a relatively you know small small amount. Um, so we're continuing to to monitor um, uh, EV growth and kind of the the behavior, the charging behavior, kind of what what happens at specific times of day, and uh, continuing to to adapt to that. Just for, for reference. Um, on, on all of TVA system, not just in the, in the state of Tennessee, we had about 27,000 EVs uh, on TVA system at the end of March. Uh, so we're, 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 we're on our way to that 200,000 goal uh, and looking forward to, to getting there. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll be there to provide the power um, to, to meet the needs of those EVs. Great, thanks Ryan. Uh, Reinhold, this question is for you. Who were the partners involved with deploying the infrastructure for the stoplights and model of the city? We are wanting to also deploy IoT in the Knoxville community and take a step towards becoming a smart city, but aren't entirely sure where the first step, what the first step would be. Yeah, the uh, big uh, help and big partner was uh, <clears throat> the um, the organization in the city, at, at the city of Chattanooga, who, who collaborated with us and helped us do the initial employ de deployment. Um, it was also in partnership with EPB, our city-owned electric utility, to provide the, the connectivity, fiber connectivity, and the power. <clears throat> um, and then uh, over time, very quickly, we also had uh, growing interactions with equipment suppliers, like, uh, uh, let's see, I've got uh, a list of those here, uh, like LiDAR, manufacturers, uh, Auster and Soul Robotics, and they all collaborated with us in deploying equipment on, on key intersection. We don't have LIDAR on every intersection, but it's it's that kind of collaborative approach um, where you you basically lay out the, the critical outcome that we're trying to achieve. And then everybody in the community uh, is, uh, you know, basically coming on board and we're uh, we're pooling resources and uh, get this started. Um, that gave us a basis for attracting outside funding, and so that has occurred. And now we can we can expand the infrastructure. In the process of setting it up, we also developed the data infrastructure, and uh, and that that is scalable. And and so we, we leveraged resources that were available at the University of Tennessee in Chattanooga. 
uh, our next question is about EV adoption. I'm excited to hear that Tennessee will be a leader in EV manufacturing and infrastructure development and construction. Is there a plan to get Tennesseans to purchase EVs? If so, can you discuss it further? Alexa, I think this one might be for you. Sure, yeah. So through the, the multi-stakeholder drive electric Tennessee initiative that Ryan mentioned previously, um, there are a number of kind of committees that are chipping away at this in various ways, um, mostly through kind of consumer education initiatives. And so um, there's been efforts to build what are called Drive Electric Tennessee chapters um, throughout the state that can essentially drive um, electric vehicle ride and drive um, events and different consumer education campaigns to promote awareness. Um, we're engaged, we're being funded by Electrify America. Actually, the Drive Electric Tennessee Initiative has received funding from Electrify America to do marketing on the internet, the radio, on television to um, increase awareness of electric vehicles within Tennessee specifically. Um, we've also kind of built out a dealership certification kind of training module that will be unveiled by Drive Electric Tennessee soon to try and get dealers, dealerships to be certified as EV friendly and kind of good um, advocates for promoting EV sales within the region. Uh, that's one big market barrier that we've seen is the at the dealership level. And so we've tried to tackle that one head on. So short of having you know a funding source that we can tap to do you know on the hood rebates, which we don't currently have access to, we're trying to kind of get at this um, topic from from other angles. Great. Just a, all right. Uh, Oh, so sorry, just to, to add to that to uh, uh, TVA is this, this is a very much an area that TVA is focused on with our consumer uh, consumer outreach and education. And I'm, I'm going to drop a link in the in the chat about a, a video that was just just published in, in Memphis about uh, driving a, a Ford Mustang around um, the, the Memphis area. So take a look at that when you get a chance. That's a good one, Ryan. I like I like that one. And there's there's more more coming the, the next two are going to be pretty fun. So just so stay tuned. Good. All right, our next uh, question comment from Wyatt, Isabel, and Wyatt, if you could tell us, I think you mean I-40, but if you could just pop in the chat, make sure I've got the interstate right. He says, we have a 20 acre parcel at exit 126, Parsons, I'd like that, I'd like to put together a group to help design, fund, and operate an EV rest area park. Who should I reach out to within the state for guidance and or partnerships? Uh, and yes, that's between Jackson and Nashville. Yeah, I can say that, you know, for the NEVI program, if, if this fell on an, uh, it sounds like it would fall on a corridor gap that we're trying to fill. So, um, as I mentioned, once the state submits its plan to the U.S. Department of Transportation by the August 1st deadline, next steps will be building out the program, designing that program and the solicitations to follow. Um, so feel free to reach out to me, make sure that you're on the, the email list that will be notified of future solicitations, um, because that could be considered an eligible project under that, uh, potentially for the NEVI program. I'll also mention that in addition to the NEVI program, there's a $2.5 billion discretionary competitive program that will be um, released, I think, later this fall by the U.S. Department of Transportation. Um, and so that can also fund alternative fuel infrastructure on designated corridors as well. And so that would be an additional program and then a third program is the Carbon Reduction Program, also funded by the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, um, and that can fund EV charging infrastructure projects. Uh, that funding will be managed by TDOT as well, um, and we're waiting to hear more information on, on the state's allocation under that program. So those are three potential funding sources that could um, you know, help with a project like that. Great, thanks, Alexa. Uh, this next question is about hydrogen and fuel cells, uh, which enable electrification for heavy duty applications uh, where the weight of batteries becomes prohibitive. Does the council have any plans for incorporating fuel cells and hydrogen into the future strategy? Um, and for this question, if you mean the Tennessee Advanced Energy Business Council, Yes, we are a member driven organization and we provide information and promote all kinds of solutions that get us to our mission. But back to the, I'll put this question back to the rest of our panelists. Um, do you all, do you all have any plans or programs initiatives that involve fuel cells and hydrogen? I know we heard from Rich with what's going on at the lab, but any of our friends at the University of Tennessee, Vanderbilt, Memphis, 
I'll, I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll chime in from TVA's perspective, um, you know, kind of looking at the national picture right now, you've got a, a, a $8 billion uh, from a DOE that's going to be coming out or that is, is out for uh, this regional hydrogen hub uh, project. So there are um, efforts underway to, to look at, you know, pos uh, positioning Tennessee and, uh, and working with a, a number of partners to locate one of those hydrogen hubs in the Tennessee Valley. Uh, we, we are we are part of that and actively working on um, you know trying to do what we can to secure some money uh, to 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 put forth a, a hydrogen hub proposal to to the Department of Energy. There's a you know a, a lot of things that will have to occur um, between um, between now and actually uh, getting a hydrogen hub, but uh, it's an effort that TVA is is, is looking at. And my my counterpart on the on the the hydrogen side is is leading that leading that effort. But yeah, beyond that, you know, there's obviously a number of uses of, of hydrogen, um, transportation being a significant uh, one of those. So we want to make sure we're kind of looking at all the options with uh, with regards to, to transportation. Great. Let's see, our next question here is beyond electric car and trucks, are any of the Tennessee manufacturers or researchers focused on battery development and manufacturing for micro mobility? So scooters, bikes, skateboards, et cetera, and or recreational transport transportation like boats, surfboards, and jet skis. Almost all the battery cells and battery packs for these industries, which is micro mobility, are currently made in China. So are any of our institutions looking and researching into options for um, electrifying micro mobility? So most of our research and development at Oak Ridge, we realize that as we're doing advanced materials, our, our target really is on road because that's where the majority of the energy is actually consumed. But we know that a lot of the times the, 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 the downsized markets in micro mobility can take advantage of those same technologies, different I mean, advanced battery cells are transportable across platforms, uh, advanced hydrogen applications are transportable across platforms. And so even though we may focus on, on the very large segments at this point, uh, which mainly is on road, uh, most of, we know most of these things are transportable down into these other micro mobility climates. So that's the way the DOE thinks about it in general. Great, let's see here. Uh, okay, that one, all right, yep. Did that one. Ah, this one's for Alexa. Alexa, what are you seeing as far as state-funded innovation in R&D in other states? Uh, is, this a is there a strong example of state dollars that have gone directly towards an innovation goal? And I, I think we can open this one up to all of our panelists. And that is, what are you seeing as far as state-funded innovation in R&D in other states? Yeah, so I can say that from, so from the State Energy Office perspective, we're a little bit limited in what we can do um, as it relates to R&D specifically. Uh, and that's mostly just because the funding sources that fund our time, a lot of them cannot be used for R&D. So like the state energy program funding that is a big primary source of funding for our office cannot be put towards R&D. Um, with that said, you know, I think we support innovation from the standpoint of either raising awareness about certain projects, trying to be the matchmaker of entities meeting together to form partnerships, playing that type of role. Um, we seek out competitive funding opportunities from the federal government that might be able to support more innovative and type R&D type projects. Um, you know, I think of the fact that we've supported and are currently engaged on a number of more demonstration type initiatives um, in the transportation electrification space. Um, we're working with Tennessee Tech University right now on a number of Department of Energy funded projects an example is this medium duty electric truck demonstration initiative um, where we'll be putting medium duty electric trucks kind of in the hands of different fleet operators throughout the state uh, to kind of put them into play um, in real, you know, real world scenarios and then gather data on success. And, and so it's kind of both an education initiative, but also a demonstration initiative. And so it's not so much R&D. Um, specifically, but that I would say that's the way in which the State Energy Office is able to support more innovative um, kind of projects. Um, so yeah, I'll pause there and see if folks have anything else to add. I, I, I perhaps have an example from another state that I'm aware of. Um, 
in Virginia. Virginia has an initiative called the Commonwealth Cyber Initiative. It's funded by the state. It funds um, more applied R&D and workforce development at a level of about $20 million a year. And it's focused on making Virginia the cybersecurity capital of the United States. So if you think about that as a model, um, we might think about doing something similar in the mobility space here in Tennessee, um, understanding our aspirations to be a national leader in this space. Yeah, great. And, and Courtney, can I just pick up off that, just uh, building on uh, the example Deb gave, uh, you know, if you think about past partnerships uh, that the state has had and investments they've made in innovation, especially with our higher uh, education institutions like University of Tennessee and Memphis uh, and Vanderbilt and others, there's been a good return on investment. So if you look at, for instance, this Composites Institute that a few of us mentioned, you know, the reason that that was successful is because the state was excited about it. They were excited about bringing companies to Tennessee. The universities were not just interested in doing, you know, research that was, that was exciting and fun and new, but they were interested in partnering with those companies to make a real difference for industry. So, you know, in terms of investment, you know, you have to really have the kind of partnership that a number of us have mentioned, and you've got to have people willing to, you know, work together to, to make the return on investment, uh, what I think the states want to see. And we've got some great examples in the past of being able to do that uh, as a state. Absolutely. Uh, we'll do two quick final questions, one related to materials. Um, on the discussion of lightweight materials, are there studies or support in the area of aluminum? A two, or are we only looking at composites? So I can, I can probably take this one. So the, uh, the auto companies are looking very heavily at aluminum. The forecast is that aluminum content will actually go up significantly during the transition to electric vehicles. The composites and particularly glass fiber and maybe carbon fiber mixed will probably go up as well. Uh, the, the ROI for investment in lightweight is about 3x under EVs than what it is under internal combustion engines. So I think you're going to see every every alternative lightweight material see more investment and it'll really be, you know, OEM at the OEMs at different vehicle, essentially different vehicle price points will likely make decisions about whether they use aluminum or composites. Okay. All right, my final question to the group is if we have interested industry folks here that are interested in par partnering with you all, Deb, you mentioned the Mobility Innovation Consortium. How do we find out more about that? And then individually, who should folks get in contact with um, if they want to talk to you all individually? Courtney, perhaps we can all give you contact information that you can send out to the participants. Maybe that's the absolutely most way to do that today. We can do that. Yeah, that's a good idea. Absolutely. If you guys are comfortable with us sharing your contact info, we can yeah. absolutely you do that. Can, absolutely. I mean, you can start with us and you know, we'll go from there. Sounds good. <laughs> Well, thank you all very much for joining us today. This was a, a great conversation and I personally am excited about the future of automotive and mobility in the state of Tennessee and the Tennessee Advanced Energy Business Council is just absolutely thrilled to be at the center of all of these discussions and, and watching this all unfold. So thank you all very much for our participants. If you want to learn more about the Tennessee Advanced Energy Business Council and join the organization, like I said, we're a member-driven organization, so you all set our priorities. You can visit tnadvancedenergy.com. Thank you very much. This concludes our webinar.